Now, you've explained to us yesterday how it was that those who took power came from the indigenous population and from the lower ranks of the army. Now, in terms of them now being in power, did that have any consequences for you in terms of you having to meet their expectations? Oh, serious consequences. How so? <clears throat> My name is Charles Taylor. Now, Taylor in Liberia is an American Liberian name. Now, for for us at that particular time and some members of the council that understood I also had Aborigines background uh, I was comfortable and they were comfortable but for a vast majority uh, of the council and I'm talking about again the PRC I was still considered a Congo man now we'll probably get into that later but the this whole thing, there, there are disparities between the use of this country Congo. So I used to make the argument, if you say I am Congo because I carry the name Taylor and you know that my mother is also country, then you have a problem. So what I was seen as at that time was some of them said, here is this Congo man who is the head of the GSA who does not want us to to uh, gain some status and let me just explain what I mean by gain status when the PRC came to power there were the general belief on their part that now we were down we are up so we have to be brought up to a certain social status that social status had to be in line with what they had seen and what they had experienced uh, in dealing with the American Liberians. So they were calling for things that they felt they that they were entitled to because the American Liberians before them had those things. Things like what? The Eagles, they wanted their homes furnished properly and who would blame them? Uh, I surely had nothing against that, and still don't. They wanted vehicles of the status that uh, other ministers that were American Liberians had in previous governments. They wanted coppers, furniture, the whole, uh, what we say, what we used to say in America, the whole nine yards, everything that they felt that the American Liberian groups had when they were in power they wanted that and who was to pay for it the taxpayers of liberia uh and this is where my problem started where i felt that yes why it was proper uh to do it uh in the beginning but some of them just kept extending it and extending it and extending it and so uh, uh resistance came about from from my side and to a great extent uh do backed me on it no. <clears throat> Mr. Griffith, sorry, what is the meaning of Congo man? I'm not sure I understand. Oh, the Congo is, uh, is the same, uh, Your Honor, uh, as uh, American Liberian. They also call Congo. Yes, um, just like uh, in neighboring Sarah, you've heard about Creole. The Creoles are American, I mean, are American, American Sarah Unions, if you want to call it. Those individuals are uh, the free slaves that came back to Sierra Leone and Liberia are called you know they are different set in Sierra Leone they are called Creoles in Liberia they call them Congo people or Americo Liberians now in your role as head of the GSA Mr. Taylor did you ever have any cause to come in contact with the United States government? Uh, yes, there, there was uh, uh, the United States uh, Agency for International Development 
uh, wanting to assist uh, the government at that time uh, did a survey of ministries and agencies of government uh, and uh, appreciated uh, what we were doing at the GSA and did say at the time that the GSA was uh, uh, the best run agency of the government. Any other contact apart from that? In your role as head of the GSA? Yes, the, there was uh, another little contact sometime, I mean, a little down the road that was, uh, I would say, a little unfortunate, but it happened. Um, <clears throat> this had to do with the, there was a piece of property uh, that was being used by the United States Trading Company. Uh, the United States Trading Company was just a name given to um, one of the many little companies that were owned and operated by the Firestone plant, Rubber Plantation Company in Liberia. The United States Trading Company sold American vehicles in Liberia and other American products and occupied not just a building but a large piece of property in an area of Morovia called United Nations Drive near the Barclay Training Center, BTC, that I spoke about in my, in my testimony here on yesterday, uh, where the barracks is. Now, the United States Trading Company closed down its operations uh, at that property. And it was turned over to the Liberian government, of which the General, Air, the General Services Administration, being responsible for securing properties, that came under the General Services Administration. Now, unfortunately, and I rarely use it unfortunately, the United States government had uh, uh, tried to use that piece of property as a major extension for uh, its intelligence operations uh, where uh, it was a large piece of property. Let me just say it was uh, situated on, I would say, about uh, a full hectare of land, not just one little lot. But this property is within a thousand meters of the Barclay Training Center the military barracks in Morovia. Unfortunately, because it was owned and operated by the Firestone Rubber uh, Plantation Company, the United States Embassy uh, did not get the okay from the General Services Agency before it uh, moved in on the property uh, had it fenced in and had contracted to a local construction company in Morovia the, the contract to renovate and upgrade the property. I objected and said that I did not feel that uh, that property should be used uh, for that particular agency that was Which supposed agency? to. Uh, it was just an extension of uh, administrative and other facilities for the uh, Central Intelligence Agency. And so I said that uh, uh, the United States was an ally, is an ally, and I will still say it's still an ally, and I have no problems with them. But I felt that even with friends and allies, there are still secrets, and that for the agency uh, to move so close to the barracks, it was not proper and that uh, we should find another piece of property uh, far from the barracks. Uh, they did not like this. They Who were, didn't like it? The United States government uh, did not like this. The embassy complained about it, and, uh, and rightly so, I guess, because they had advanced about 300,000, I understand, United States dollars, to the contractor who had actually fenced the property in and had commenced work, and the work was stopped. 
Uh, Doe, the complaint was taken to Doe. Uh, Doe called me in and I explained to him and he agreed with me but he pulled a little fast one on me. He then decides that he is going to send the matter over to the then Minister of Justice, Councillor Winston Tupman. Um, that's a name we've heard before. That is correct. Uh, Tupman, we mentioned him on yesterday as being at the at the consulate in New York when I was a student that took it over. So now he's Minister of Justice, is he? In the Doe government, that is correct. Uh, Councillor Tupman rules that he sees no reason why the United States government cannot use uh, the property. Uh, the decision is taken to Doe, and what I mean by he pulled a fast one, Doe disagreed with Tupman, agreed with me, uh, but made the United States Embassy understand that uh, all the matter is, is, with, is with Taylor. And, and I'm sure the United States Ambassador should have known that there was no way I could disobey the President's order if he seriously wanted them to use that property. And so I was then put on a firing line to keep saying, uh, you know, we can't let it happen. And uh, if you have a problem, go back to the president. But the president had already told me that they should not have it. And so that's what I mean by, so that was the second contact that I had with the uh, United States Embassy at the time.